Hello, my name is Paul Worthington. I'm the Director of Research and Development for Linda Bell Learning Processes. I'd like to thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to spend a bit of time addressing this, um, this particular issue, remediating the dyslexic brain, covering some neuroscience, the research that's associated with that, and some uh, solutions for recovery, not only in terms of recovering uh, the needs of the, those individuals who have dyslexia, but looking at it more systematically um, across the board in schools, um, et, et cetera. Dys dyslexia occurs in at least one in 10 people, putting more than 700 million children and adults wor worldwide at risk of lung, uh, lifelong illiteracy to include social exclusion. There are significant numbers of students with dyslexia that go undiagnosed and their symptoms unaddressed. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. With tragic results, of course, due to um, the largely the global lack of awareness and knowledge about this common learning difference. Here's some general bullets that we're going to cover. Um, just a little bit on the current um, definition of dyslexia um, as associated with a new science, some, uh, some words, some information on the scientific theoretical model that we're looking at to address dyslexia, um, a series of collaborative research initiatives with those universities that are listed there, um, some information on the current state level of dyslexia law, uh, along with uh, some of the efforts that we're involved in associated with that. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the results that we have inside our centers and in working with dyslexics, um, the intervention results on a longitudinal analysis that we've done, and a just a final peek at some current um, research in the world of dyslexia and reading disabilities that have to do with uh, orthographic processing. And finally, uh, some things that we're looking at in the future for um, additional research initiatives. From, uh, according to Reed Lyon, Jack Fletcher, Sally, and Bennett Shaywitz, and a number of others, work, they worked very diligently starting back in 2002. And this definition is pretty much held to the present, that dyslexia is a specific learning disability that is neurological in, in origin. It is characterized by difficulties associated with the accurate and or fluent work recognition and by poor spelling and decoding abilities. These difficulties typically result from a deficit in phonologic component of language that is often unexpected in relation to other cognitive abilities and the provisions of effective classroom instruction. The information I'm gonna go, go over today is going to um, speak to that whole definition and ask some questions relative to whether or not um, that's currently um, satisfies us based on the findings of what is um, now known about dyslexia. In fact, some would argue that it's a challenge uh, from the new science that's emerging. These uh, research efforts are, uh, <clears throat> offer new renewed hope to address the needs of individuals with dyslexia, including those di diagnosed with severe dyslexia. This research now challenges the idea that the phonological component of reading is the definitive deficit for dyslexia. The bottom line is that it may be too simplistic. What I'm saying here is that um, the weight that has been given to it, not that the, the phonological core deficit is not valid, it's just that it may be limited in its association with completely understanding what it means to be dyslexic. This research, I think you'll find, reveals that the sens sensory cognitive function of symbol imagery is necessary for both the phonological and orthographic components of reading. And I'm gonna define that in just a, in a few minutes. Research also indicates that an instructional model to, to currently address both the phonological and the orthographic components of reading results in significant gains in reading for dyslexic. So what is symbol imagery? 
if I were to ask you to take a look at this word and then take it away and ask you to hold that word in your um, lexicon or your visual memory, and then I were to say to you, what was the fifth letter in that word? Um, just happens to be a nonsense word. So holding that letter, those letter patterns in your working memory, if you reverse the last two letters, what would the word say? Instead of saying flips, it would say flips. So what is it that enables you to process that information? Symbol imagery is the ability to create mental imagery for sound and letters within words, a sensory cognitive function for orthographic and phonological processing. So if you have a child that's just looking at a simple word, um, what's being suggested here is that there's a pairing relationship that corresponds to the ability to read words accurately. If we look at it from a symptomatic standpoint, here's some of the classic symptoms that, uh, that are associated with a weakness in symbol imagery. The ability to attack words that you've never seen before, obviously word recognition skills, if you wanna uh, put that into the context of sight words, we're gonna talk, talk more about that a little bit later. Weak phonological uh, spelling skills, difficulty reading fluently, contextually, and slow and laborious decoding skills. And you see it even with kids who can decode accurately, but their decoding and or spelling is just pathetically slow. And of course, students who fall in this category may be dislabeled as dyslexic. If you want to look at this sort of from the whole picture in where these fit together, um, the idea being that sensory cognitive functions underlie the component parts of reading. And as we go on through the presentation, measure that against um, research theory and then the practical applications of how that's addressed. We know that in the phonological side, if we're thinking about the auditory component, um, everybody understands clearly that phonological processing, such as word attack skills, et cetera, are a major component. On the visual side, the argument that's being suggested here is that um, equally orthographic processing, the ability to manipulate the graphemes or the letter relationships in syllables and multisyllable words plays a role. And of course, uh, in contextual reading and the development of vocabulary overall with uh, syntactic, semantic structures, et cetera, is important, especially with regard to receptive oral vocabulary. So if we're looking at the, the overall component that's relating to this, is there a theoretical model that adequately addresses um, this more comprehensive look in terms of what's being suggested for the needs of dyslexia. Turns out there is, at least it's one that we abide by very carefully and is substantially supported by research um, to include phonological and orthographically coded processing for decoding. As it turns out, the seventh edition of this book that has been around for a long time was recently released. Uh, there's a major chapter in there uh, by Mark Sadowski and colleagues that pertains directly to um, dual coding theory. It's referred to as the scientific theory of literacy, and it's among the strong, strongest current candidates for developing a unified scientifically based theory of literacy. And it provides a unified account of all aspects of reading under a common set of principles. Drilling down on that just a little more, the primary researcher associated with this particular theory, Alan Pabio, suggests that cognition is proportional to the extent that the coding mechanisms of mental representations, broadly interpreted, we'll call it imagery, and language are integrated. He suggests that linguistic competence and performance are based on a substrate of imaginal processes to include, for example, perceiving sounds and the relationship to one another in syllables, as well as the organization and manipulation of letters, or graphemes, and syllables. And what we know, based on current research, that individuals differ in the extent, the manner, and the efficiency of employment of each of these sensory systems according to their verbal and nonverbal habits and skills. So this theoretical model um, actually 
um, challenges in the sense of adding to an understanding of those processes that are necessary for effective decoding and encoding or reading and spelling. Um, going back, I would say now over 20 years, um, those of us at Linda Mood Bell consistently noted significant gains in phonemic awareness and word attack when we were using a predominantly phonological uh, process of teaching reading. And Nancy, in fact, says, uh, however, our students continued to struggle with word recognition and paragraph reading. And that challenged us to think about what else was necessary. What we saw is that students demonstrated slow and tedious word attack skills. They had difficulty transitioning to sight words. Word, rec word recognition did not improve as much as word attack. Thus, contextualized, uh, contextual decoding and contextual fluency remain substantially below potential. We also saw that students read word by word in connected text, text and guessed at words to improve the reading rate. And finally, they spelled phonologically rather than relying also on um, orthographically um, based processes. In other words, since a lot of words are not spelled phonetically, if they couldn't hold the orthographic pattern, they had no assistance from that particular domain. Really what we came to discover is that there was a spectrum on, based upon dual coding theory and the role of imagery. If we look at this comprehensive model, I referred to those, that Venn diagram with the greater um, circle encompassing that paradigm that includes not only decoding, but it turns out that uh, imagery is also related to comprehension skills. So if we think about it in the context of the spectrum going all the way from dyslexia to uh, conditions known as hyperlexia and children who are experiencing autism, um, it helps us understand the potential of that particular theoretical model to ad address the needs of kids um, overall in a base of a literacy theory that can accommodate um, children within um, these kinds of difficulties. Talking a little bit more about the orthographic coding for printed words, this is nothing new. It's been around for some time. Virginia Berninger noted the, week of, uh, the role of weak orthographic processing in disabled readers. She says, it's been clearly shown that skilled readers code the visual information in printed words. Disabled readers may fail to code that visual information efficiently or sufficiently. Nancy, um, in her subsequent work, when we started to develop what we're calling a, the processes of teaching reading using symbol imagery, states that there are individual differences in symbol imagery. Those differences impact the coding of printed words and thus orthographic and phonological processing in literacy skills. Once we uncovered this, we actually drilled down and started looking at a way to psychometrically measure that particular skill. And we de ultimately developed what we're referring to as the symbol imagery test. In looking at um, a, larger, a large cross cross-section of students um, in terms of age, et cetera, measuring uh, some of the correlations and the magnitude of those correlations to some of the classic uh, decoding skills that we all worry about to include rate, accuracy, fluency, and comprehension, word recognition skills based upon sight words as measured on the Slauson oral reading test, spelling as measured on the wide range achievement test, and even word attack skills. You can see the correlations are extremely large. And so that led us to saying, okay, if there is a strong relationship between being able to manipulate the letter and the letters and relationships to one another in syllables the same way that we measure phonological skills such as on the C top and on the LAC test which measures phonemic awareness then we might be on to something here in terms of having a ro more robust, well, robust level of analyzing the needs of students. So we took a look at it from the correlation standpoint and seeing how that relates to phonological processing. And again, we saw large correlations. 
okay, so is there a way to, to more deeply understand this? So we went ahead and did a uh, norming on the test for students age, ra age range from six and a half to almost 18 years old to take a look at the dependent variables associated with the SI test is what you see uh, there on the left hand side and then relate that to other phonological assessments including the LAC test was, which was developed by Pat Lindemood and then take a look at it, their relationships um, to the other um, classic things that we worry about where decoding is concerned. So when the SI test, the LAC test and the CTOP tests were combined as a, as a testing model to predict student performance in those tests that are listening there, word attack, word recognition, spelling, rate, accuracy, and fluency, what you can see is that the S SI test was the strong strongest predictor in every case. For example, the word attack, the total testing model predicts 52% per of the variance of student performance in word attack, and the S SI test alone predicts 47% 40, uh, of that variance, suggesting that it was the major contributor and basically it was almost a mirror image of phonemic awareness where students were at asked to manipulate orthographic patterns in associated uh, with these reading skills listed. So the outcome of that was the development of a program to not only stimulate phonemic awareness but also to develop uh, symbol imagery. In other words, having the concurrent development of both phonological processing as well as the orthographic ability to manip manipulate sounds and letters. Based upon that, there's a number of studies that were done, and I'm going to just go through some of the highlights of these studies in collaboration with uh, research institutions across the United States, starting with the University of Washington up in Seattle. Measuring neurological and behavioral research in dyslexia with the intervention of choice being the symbol imagery um, approach that we've developed. At the Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences, this randomized controlled intervention study focused on the brain connectivity effects in those particular areas, and I'm going to show you a graphic here on those areas uh, of the human brain where language and sounds are processed, and then including the visual inputs such as letters on a page are transmitted through the, throughout the brain and the posterior colossal connections which link the hemispheres of the brain. The point being is we're looking at both the phonological as well as the orthographic components to see what happens as a result from pre to post as compared to controls on the connectivity between those cortical areas in the human brain regarding the findings. The study used this longitudinal intervention designed to examine experience dependent growth in reading skills and white matter or the connectivity in grade school age struggling readers using diffusion MRI data that was collected at regular intervals during this eight week intervention, uh, intensive reading intervention. And by the way, um, the intervention was conducted by Linda Moo Bell staff in order to protect the fidelity of the interventions that were used. These measurements revealed large scale changes throughout a collection of white matter tracts in concert with growth in the reading skills. In other words, there was concurrent matching growth on the conductivity in the white matter of the brain as associated with development of reading skills. The particular findings are as follows. Reading skills improved by an average of one full grade level for the students who took part in this eight week intervention to develop symbol imagery for phonological and orthographic processing. The diffusion MRI data collected during instruction indicates that there were large scale changes in white matter conductivity correlating with gains in reading. Subjects in the control group showed no changes. So the intervention to stimulate and develop symbol imagery led to increased brain structural conductivity and improved reading for uh, children with the reading difficulties, including dyslexia. It examined an intensive intervention 
program in combination with the longitudinal diffusion MRI measurements and it, investigating the sensitive period for white matter plas plastici plasticity and literacy learning. Based upon the authors, they find that the intervention induced large scale changes in the white matter, as I've already indicated. They further conclude that for the intensive one-to-one -one reading intervention program employed, if a sensitive period exists, it does not end for middle school. And this was the second study based upon that study, and that's a secondary finding, is that developmentally, it was working as effectively um, in the work that we did with middle school child children as it did with the, uh, with the younger student. The third study associated with the work that we did up there had a goal of analyzing reading growth curves during an intensive intervention. 31 children with reading difficulties enrolled in 160 hours of the intervention over, the, again, that eight-week summer se uh, session. They collected behavioral measures over four sessions assessing decoding, oral reading, fluency, comprehension, etc. And using a mixed effects mo uh, model of longitudinal measurements, they revealed, and this is a second, um, a new finding, that there was a linear dose response relationship between the hours of intervention and improvement in reading ability. So what does that mean? That means the more intervention we were able to offer, that the dose response had a correlation on an increase um, concurrent with more hours of intervention using the same uh, the same intervention methodology. There was significant li linear growth on every measure of reading skill and none of the measures showed non-linear growth trajectories. As part of this, the decoding skills show substantial growth with fluency and comprehension growing more gradually. Point being, if you teach them to read, then they can access the information from a cognitive standpoint uh, yielding growth in comprehension. The results highlight the opportunity to improve reading skills over an intensive short-term summer intervention program, again with this linear dose response relationship between dura duration and gains enabling educators to set reading goals and design a treatment pla plan to achieve them. We're now carefully looking at the algorithm that's associated with that, being able to predict more um, more carefully the necessary hours of intervention, assuming that the fidelity of the intervention is specifically addressing the needs of the dyslexic. Overall, from the University of Washington, Jason Yateman, who is the principal investigator in, um, in this effort with that university, states that while many parents and teachers might worry that dyslexia is permanent, reflecting intrinsic deficits in the brain, these findings demonstrate that targeted Intensive reading programs not only lead to substantial improvements in reading skills, but also change the underlying wiring of the brain's reading circuitry. That's very positive information. Beyond what we did um, at the University of Washington, Washington was the, some work that we did in, at uh, Georgetown University with Guinevere Eden and her colleagues. In this first study where 11, 11 children identified as dyslexic, they received again the same intervention. We again offered uh, the intervention f with our own staff, eight weeks. Um, it showed marked improvement in several readings in related reading skills. And there are the statistically significant numbers that associated with uh, the pre and post measurements. Likewise, the improvements in reading ability were accompanied by changes in the brain structure. There are four areas that they noted. Um, I'm not going to go into any details on those, but the findings that are quite interesting paralleled what um, we subsequently found at the University of Washington is that at time two in time one where we did a pre-assessment, time two, and then without intervention between time two and time three, the skills that were developed uh, during that eight week period of time actually continued to grow in these brain areas that were associated with um, additional growth in the uh, gray matter. On the conclusion, the training induced changes in the gray matter volume 
then those were, were observed in a pediatric example for the, su for the same time. What's being suggested here, in fact what was found, is that in association with the intervention, the actual gray matter volume that can be measured through uh, MRI technology increased as a result of the intervention. And the reading improvements resulting from that intervention are accompanied by actual growth in brain structure. Massachusetts, um, we had the luxury of working with John Gabrielli and some of his staff in some interventions that were uh, conducted, conducted uh, specifically on the impact of an intensive summer reading intervention for children with reading disabilities. The children with those reading disabilities or difficulties were randomly assigned to receive um, the same instruction using the symbol imagery <coughs> uh, as compared to a weightless control. Again, we looked at the pre and post testing. What we found is that it was revealed there were significant interactions in favor of the intervention group for untimed word and pseudo word reading. This study offered direct evidence for the widening differences in reading abilities between students with reading disability who do and do not receive uh, intensive reading instruction. The intervention implications on this particular study for these children were discussed, especially in relation to the relevance of summer intervention to prevent further decline. We did another study with MIT, and um, what was fascinating about this, and we, this was not actually um, part of the intent of the study, but in a post hoc analysis, they decided to look at the socioeconomic status as associated with reading disability in those uh, children that were part of the intervention. As correlated to the neuroanatomy uh, and the plasticity in, res plasticity in response to the intervention. So these 65 children with diverse SES were assigned to this a six week reading intervention before and after all the children completed the standardized uh, reading assessments and the magnetic resonance image to measure cortical thickness. So this is the third interesting neurological artifact having looked at the white matter changes, gray matter changes, and now looking at cortical thickness. At baseline, the higher SES correlated with greater vocabulary and greater, greater cortical thickness in particular areas of the brain, specifically in the bilateral paracylvian and supramarginal regions. And so, what was the outcome of that? With the intervention group, the lower SES was associated with both greater reading improvement and greater cortical thickening across broad areas in the occipital temporal and the temporal parietal regions associated with the in, uh, intervention. And guess what? Those are areas that are classically associated with the uh, ability to ma manipulate uh, graphemes or, again, the symbols associated with reading. They indicate, the, the findings indicate that effective summer reading intervention is coupled with greater cortical growth and is especially beneficial for children uh, from lower SES home environments. Finally, at the university side, in terms of the formal analysis of the work that we do, and this is interesting because it's not a neuroscience study, but it's an applied study in a whole school district. Uh, it's entitled, The Effects of a Theoretically Based Large-Scale Reading Intervention in a Multicultural Urban School District. Uh, that school district was in Pueblo, Colorado. Uh, the research was done um, using dual coding theory as the theoretically based large-scale reading intervention. And what you see here, the simple interpretation of this is that there were six years of analysis on a state mandated assessment, it was called the CSAP, where you look at the scores on a state mandated assessment on the percentages of students who were unsatisfactory, the students who were partially proficient over time, the growth in students in proficient, and then the growth in students who um, changed in their advanced reading categories. And what you see in each of those categories, starting in 2000, or sorry, in, in 08, in, um, uh, sorry, in 
yeah, in, in uh, 1998, that the percentage of students over time that were unsatisfactory as compared to the students who were proficient, the students who were proficient increased the percentage of students who were unsatisf uh, uns unsatisfactory actually decreased. Um, and so this is an interesting dependent measure because we weren't using standardized reading tests, but we're using state mandated tests. In, in some, the, uh, the values were statistically controlled for, for uh, school size, percentage of minority students, percentage of students receiving free and reduced uh, price lunches. So Pueblo School District versus all other Colorado schools in grade three for the Colorado State Arrest, uh, Assessment Program scoring categories was able to apply that across the board in public education with substantial increases in the proficiency and advance and decreases in the number of students who were partially proficient and unsatisfactory. Let me just talk for a minute about what's going on in a contemporary setting. We have, based upon some work going on in Arkansas, a number of students um, who were receiving, um, and I'll get to sort of the mandate about this, but just to show you um, some ongoing work that we're engaged in, in students who have purely decoding um, kinds of issues, looking at their pre and post assessments, um, for a population of students. This is where we train teachers in the classroom. The classroom teachers then deliver the instruction addressing the needs of students who are experiencing um, difficulties to include a diagnosis um, for dyslexia. What's interesting about this is when you look at it from a standard score change is that now we're translating this very specifically into students who are dyslexic. And as you can see, there are large, medium, and um, vocabulary was not an area of instruction that was even being addressed um, because these students were dyslexic. So we saw substantive, substantive changes associated with the word attack, word recognition, especially in the, in the area of transference into accuracy, fluency, and the fringe benefit of increasing their comprehension. Why was this, um, what was the catalyst for this particular endeavor? Along with the federal government, which, which has passed um, legislation meet, uh, to address the needs of dyslexics, um, I think it's close to 40 states have done the same thing. Um, some are bills that are on the table. In the case of Arkansas, it's actually an act. What that means that it's the law. An act to ensure that children with dyslexia have their needs met by the public school system. This was really the catalyst that got us going for the work that we're doing in the state uh, or in the, the school system of uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas. A subtitle uh, 17 in that legislation and that, that bill ensures that children with dyslexia have their needs met um, in the public school system. Fort Smith contracted with us. We have trained hundreds of teachers to address that. And one of the interesting things is that now working with children in the public sector having literally decades of information in the private sector and the work that we're doing here at Linda Mood Bell, we can take a look at students that we know have dyslexia and do some comparisons to protect the fidelity of what it is that we're doing as we train teachers in the public sector. If we look at our own de decoding instruction, um, we have um, currently over t uh, on this particular database, over 2,000 children who uh, have a prior diagnosis of dys dyslexia when they come to us for instruction. And you can see the pre and post percentiles there and the associated changes looking at developments on their standard scores. Beyond that, what's really interesting since we have all this data and now it's associated with what's going on in the neuroscience community, We've engaged in a ongoing longitudinal study, 10 years long um, at this point, because we've had uh, so many children who have come uh, to us either with a diagnosed or an undiagnosed dyslexic profile. 
So in addition to these neurosciences, we internally have been tracking our clinical data on students with dyslexia, with a dyslexic profile against those who were previously diagnosed as dys dyslexic and those who were not yet identified but yet exhibited a dyslexic profile. We took all of those students, you're going to see the thousands of students, the, the aggregate numbers of those, and then compared those to the students from the University of Washington study that I referred to earlier. So here's the general profile. For all students, we're taking a look at an aggregate number of over 7,000 children. In group one, were the students, the 30 students that I talked to you earlier about, uh, the th who were as part of the study uh, with the University of Washington. The students who landed in Linda Mood Bell, brought to us via their parents or through school contracts, 1,700 kids who were previously diagnosed with dyslexia. And then using those profiles, we went into our database and said, as it turns out, we had another 5,400 uh, 5, children who had a diagnosed or had an undiagnosed dyslexic profile, but had not been uh, in receipt of that uh, specific diagnosis. There's some demographic data. As you can see, it's pretty classic, especially in terms of the percentages of male versus female, roughly uh, the same. When we take a look at the pre-assessment uh, pre profile or the pre-mean uh, percentiles based on that population, you can see uh, across all four groups, um, all students, the neuroscientific group or the UW kids, the undiagnosed and the diagnosed dyslexics. Over on the right hand side, we see that they all had uh, essentially the equal kind of uh, a commensurate kind of potential if we're looking at receptive vocabulary. So we've got a good population to do some comparative analysis on. And of course, then they go through the treatment how do, we, how do they fare in terms of looking at their standard score growth? And this is for all the students um, disaggregated against um, or into the four different groups. For example, if we look at accuracy, 9.9 .9 standard score growth for the, when we look at all the students and then the associated growth numbers for the students that we've disaggregated. There's another way to look at this, and I'm gonna skip through some of this because if we look at the, the profiles uh, from a, a percentile standpoint, you can see that all, um, all of those students in combination made statistically significant gains. There's the standard score gains. There's one other way to look at this, and it goes to the question of how much are we really changing the profile of these students? If we look at it from a quartile basis, one of the classic determinations is, are we changing the profile enough to consider whether or not these students are still dyslexic? So if we just ask the question of the, the whole population at large, that end of uh, 7,000 students, was, were there any quartile increases in some of the classic measurements that we look at in their symbol imagery, their phone phonemic aware awareness is measured on the LAC test, their word recognition skills, accuracy and fluency. Of the 7,000 students, under SI you can see 5,000 of those students had a quartile increase. In other words, in their orthographic processing, 4,500 students in had an increase in their phonemic awareness, 4,000 in their word recognition skills, et cetera. If you want to look at it from a percentage standpoint, go down to the percent quartile increase. 70, uh, 71%, 64, 57, 45, 36. Even in fluency, 36% of those students had an increase, a quartile increase in their ability to read fluently. 62% didn't change. While they did make progress, they didn't jump a whole quartile. And 3% had a quartile decrease. 
there's even a more refined way to look at it. We've had, if we break that out into whether or not there was one quartile, two quartiles, or even three quartile increase, of the 7,000 students in fluency, we're seeing um, there were 257, for example, in the LAC test that increased a whole uh, three quartiles, um, jumping down to the percentile increase. Let's just jump over to accuracy. 29% of the students went from the lower quartile into what would considered, be considered as a normal ra ra range of functioning. So in conclusion, what does this mean? Is that it means that over, for X amount of hours instruction, we are seeing substantive changes for large percentages of the students who are leaving that profile of being dyslexic. And if you recall back, one of the studies that I referred to at the University of Washington talked about a dose-response relationship. If we had 160 hours for students out of that group of kids and we get a change of 43% 40, in accuracy and 34% in fluency, what would that mean if we stretch that algorithm out and we give them 200 hours of intervention? What we can presuppose is that the, if the dose rela if the dose-response relationship is valid, which based on the research at the University of Washington, it looks like it is, then we can start to ascertain how much intervention students are gonna need predicated on their profile. These are very exciting findings that demonstrate the, effect, the efficacy of intensive intervention to develop the sensory cognitive function of symbol imagery along with phonemic, that includes phonemic awareness for dyslexic readers. They validate the tenets of dual coding theory and the findings are consistent with the current neuroscientific investigations using the instructional methodology that we've been talking about. If you don't think it's an issue from a policy standpoint, as we're wrapping this up, research estimates that 80%, this is a quote from a current uh, newspaper article in 2019 in Asheville, North Carolina. Research estimates 80% of all learning disabilities are a form of dyslexia. The condition is genetic and it never goes away. That is still a prevailing mentality that the public has, um, and who knows what percentage it is, but thinking about it from that context raises the question, based on the research that we've just reviewed, as to whether or not it really is um, it being dyslexia really is something of a terminal nature. Nancy says that we have always believed and we now have evidence that all individuals can be taught to reach their potential, including dyslexics. It does not have to be a lifelong challenge and thus many learning challenges do not have to be tolerated by so many children, especially as we said at the outset of this presentation, because there are so many. Finally, I'd like to, uh, there's some new information that was just released and I'm gonna quickly go through this. Um, I'm, I probably won't read all of the information, but um, a lot more research, research is being done on this orthographic processing uh, component in teaching reading. This particular piece, I'm just gonna review quickly because it goes exactly to everything that we've discovered. The, this particular peer-reviewed article is entitled Orthographic Processing is a Key Predictor of Reading Fluency in Good and Poor Readers in a Transparent Orthography. Uh, Elena Gregorenko and her colleagues put this study together with one of the main goals of the study was to disentangle the contribution of orthographic processing from that of phonological processing in decoding. Her proposition um, was that in order to understand reading development and the nature of difficulties in achieving skilled reading, it's necessary to understand what skills, which is what we've been talking about, beyond decoding accuracy and its correlate, phono, uh, correlate phonological processing are important for developing reading skills. And as you, from the title suggests, what she's looking at is orthographic processing. We all know that phonological processing skills have become widely accepted as a fundamental causal in, uh, influence in learning to decode across a, a wide variety of orthographies, both deep and shallow. 
She suggests that there's evidence that phonemic awareness deficits may be a consequence. This is very interesting. Or what she calls a co-requisite rather than a cause of reading difficulties. That suggests, again, this idea behind the dual coding nature of being able to read and spell effectively. She further states that an additional class of skills involved in reading acquisition is orthographic processing skills. I quoted Virginia Berninger earlier, Stan, uh, Keith Stanovich, a number of other people have been hinting around this, Nathalie Badian, and it goes on to suggest that orthographic processing has been extensively studied in skilled readers, and its role in reading acquisition has been gaining interest in the reading literature, focusing on the development and the impairment of reading. Even though its contribution to the acquisition of fluent reading, fluent reading remains far less studied than that of phonological processing skills. One reason for this may be the difficulty in conceptualizing orthographic skills as independent from phonological skills or even in providing a consistent definition. When I referred to the work that we did in the development of the symbol imagery test, we found the same thing. An outcome of the study or a result indicated that orthographic skills significantly contributed to sight words in both good and poor readers and to word decoding accuracy in good readers. Orthographic skills also directly contributed to reading fluency in both groups. Here's the interesting sidebar um, part of this study. Phonological skills were a significant predictor of word decoding for both good and poor readers. Nothing new there and unitization, which in uh, Elena's language, that means sight words, but it did not contribute directly to reading fluency in either group. So the re her results also confirm the importance of orthographic skills in, in, and reveal a limited contribution of phonological processing skills to reading fluency. Let me reemphasize here, this is not saying that phonological skills do not play an underlying ro role in the acquisition of decoding skills, especially at the word recognition level. But she says in both good and readers in grades two through six, grades in which children are expected to have learned the individual letter, sound correspondences, and master ba basic decoding skills, in our model, that she proposes here with word decoding accuracy and word unitization, or again, sight words, as mediators, even though phonological skills made a contribution to both decoding accuracy and sight words, they do not either directly or indirectly contribute to reading fluency. The argument that's being proposed is that reading lands predominantly at a visual level, and if you think about the psychophysics associated with it, is that we need immediate word recognition skills instead of having to sound words out and spit and grunt our way through every syllable, which is necessary from a phonological processing standpoint. In other words, it's necessary but not sufficient to be an affluent reader. At the end of the study, she suggests that additional research is needed to investigate the sources of heterogeneity in orthographic learning an area overshadowed by the focus on phonological processes adopted by research in the last few decades. We all know that. We've been researching the phonological component for quite some time. Visual attention proposed as a candidate for the basis of individual differences in reading. Disability is a plausible candidate. We would agree. Successful intervention approaches to targeting fluency would have to overcome this problem and create rewarding training conditions that allow struggling readers to attain high levels of exposure to a print necessary for successful orthographic learning. What the authors of this paper perhaps do not know is what I've been sharing with you is that's already been done. We think this is showing up as a successful intervention. Yes, we need to do more research. Speaking of which, Here's the research horizons that we're still looking at. We're critically interested in both not only the genetic, but the epigenetic questions by epigenetics. In other words, the environmental 
um, components that contribute to reading, such as competent teaching, um, family environments, school environments, and so forth. We're going to continue to look at future research on the propositions of dual coding theory. This, uh, there's an under-connectivity hypothesis that is out there regarding dual coding being able to explain the under-connectivity that's been associated or that was uncovered um, in the work that I referred to at the University of Washington of Washington. We're continuing looking at comorbidity issues between uh, reading and mathematics. We currently have had the pleasure of working with Georgetown University. They're finishing a um, comorbidity study on the relationship between reading disabilities and math. We have not found out what the outcomes of that work had, that's been done by Guinevere Eden again and her colleagues. We're looking for opportunities to do more uh, research in public education, and we uh, have some interesting data that we're analyzing from the school improvement grant uh, outcomes. As a sidebar, uh, we've been conducting research on autism at the University of Alabama, and I'm happy to announce that we're going to continue our dyslexia research starting this coming summer with Jason Yateman, who is now at Stanford University, um, and looking at much more longitudinal data on the re uh, interventions I referred to only at Stanford University versus, uh, versus the University of Washington. And we have a standing proposal entitled An Efficacy Study of the Linda Mood Bell Complete Intervention for Upper Elementary Students with or at risk for reading disabilities. That is in collaboration under a, um, a grant proposal request from the U.S. Department of Education. And we are engaging, hopefully, in this research with uh, the American Institute of Research. So there's a lot more to learn. Um, I'm going to thank you. And here's my contact information. Surely this might. Um, yield a number of questions from those of you who have had an opportunity to review this. Please feel free to contact myself or those of us at Linda Mubell um, pertaining to this information or the needs of your dyslexic children. Thank you.